Hello everyone. Today we will be talking about antepartum hemorrhage. So antepartum hemorrhage can be divided into bleeding that occurs in the first trimester and bleeding that occurs in the second and third trimester. First trimester bleeding uh, could be due to causes like ectopic pregnancy, abortion, it could be physiologic like implantation bleeding of pregnancy and it could also be due to bleeding from the lower genital tract like a cervical cause as in polyps or it could also be because of an infection of the uterus. Now if there is a suspected first trimester bleed we have to take a complete history, physical examination and do an ultrasound. On ultrasound if you see there is an intrauterine pregnancy along with bleeding that is originating from the uterus the most possible cause would be an abortion and in that case if the fetal cardiac activity is present then it's most likely a threatened abortion otherwise it could either be an inevitable abortion or a complete abortion depending on whether the products of conception has been expelled out or not. Suppose on ultrasound you find that there is no intrauterine pregnancy then it could either be a very early viable pregnancy that has not been detected on an ultrasound or it could be an ectopic pregnancy and this can be differentiated using serial beta HCG levels. If the beta HCG level rises by around 35 to 50 percent in 48 hours then it's more likely a viable pregnancy. Whereas if the beta HCG rises uh, lesser than this amount and a very small beta HCG level then it's more likely to be an ectopic pregnancy. And it's very important to know that a rupture of an ectopic pregnancy could lead to very serious bleeding that is of concern to maternal hemodynamic stability. So ectopic pregnancy has to be excluded in all pregnant patients with bleeding especially first trimester bleeding. Coming to the second and third trimester bleeding, common causes are of course labor wherein the bleeding is because of bloody show. Then uh, causes like placenta previa, abruptio placenta, uterine rupture, vasa previa and also causes due to cervical, vaginal or uterine infection or presence of polyps. Now this video is going to focus mainly on three uh, causes that's placenta previa, abruptio placenta and vasa previa. So coming first to placenta previa. So a few risk factors for placenta previa would be a history of previous placenta previa, a prior cesarean section, multiple gestation, multiparity and smoking. So these are common risk factors for placenta previa and the pathogenesis of placenta previa is largely unknown. It is thought to occur due to reduced vascularization of the uterine decidua in the upper segment of the uterus possibly due to previous surgery. So what happens is that the trophoblast implantation is going to be uh, promoted in the lower uterine cavity because the uh, vascularity in the upper decidua is reduced. And it is also thought that in case of multiple gestation where there is a very large placental mass this increases the chances of that placenta covering the cervical os. And in case of placenta previa, the bleeding occurs due to uterine contractions or due to the changes that occur in the cervix which leads to shearing forces on that placenta. And also digital cervical examination can also disrupt the placenta which can lead to bleeding and this is why digital cervical examination is contraindicated in placenta previa. And in a placenta previa the, the origin of this bleeding is usually maternal blood. So this would result in a large volume but painless bleeding and the fetal uh, status is usually reassuring. The clinical features of a placenta previa is uh, usually we find a placenta previa on a routine ultrasound examination at 16 to 20 weeks of gestation. And as I've mentioned, it is a painless vaginal bleeding in the third trimester. For diagnosis, we usually diagnose using a transabdominal ultrasound first as the initial screening test. And that is later followed by a transvaginal ultrasound 
that is done for clearer visualization of the relationship between the edge of the placenta and the internal os. On this uh, uh, USG, we define something called a low-lying placenta previa or a low-lying placenta as when the edge of the placenta is less than 2 cm from the internal os. That is called a low-lying low placenta. Now, what is the natural course of a placenta previa? Most of these placenta previas that are diagnosed before 20 weeks of gestation usually resolve before delivery. Now, there are two theories behind why this happens. One is that the lower uterine segment essentially lengthens as the pregnancy advances towards term. And as the lower uterine segment lengthens, this shifts the placenta away from the internal loss. Also, the lower uterine segment is less vascular compared to the upper segment. So, as the placenta grows, it does so preferentially towards the upper segment because of its better blood supply compared to the lower segment. And this leads to migration of the tro trophoblast towards the uterine fundus and this is called trophotropism. Okay, so that is called trophotropism. All right. So that is why towards term, the placenta essentially shifts away from the cervical os and most of these cases would resolve before delivery. But there are three important features which would increase the chance of a persistent placenta previa even in the third trimester or at term. So that is when even in the third trimester the placenta previa has, is still over the cervical os and has not moved, that is one. The second is if the placenta has extension that more that is more than 2.5 centimeters over the cervical os. And the third case is if the placenta is posteriorly located. So in these three cases, there is less chance of resolution of the placenta previa. Now coming to the management of placenta previa, the general advice is to avoid digital cervical examination, avoid intercourse, and to avoid strenuous exercise or prolonged standing for more than four hours. This is the general management for placenta previa. Now, what about acute management? Suppose it's a lady who comes with active bleeding, you have to admit the patient and the first thing would be to achieve maternal hemodynamic stability. That is by giving IV fluids, the IV crystalloids and blood transfusion. Suppose the blood transfusion fails to stabilize the mother, then you have to go for the massive transfusion protocol that is abbreviated as MTP and this is with a 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio of packed red blood cells is to platelets is to fresh frozen plasma. Along with the goal of uh, achieving maternal hemodynamic stability, you have to do fetal heart rate monitoring to make sure that the fetal status is reassuring. Now, what are the indications for cesarean delivery? The first is if the mother is in active labor. If she is actively bleeding with inability to maintain hemodynamic stability. If it is a category 3 fetal heart rate tracing, that is a non-reassuring tracing that is not responding to resuscitative measures like giving IV fluids to the mother, left lateral decubitus position, stopping all the oxytocin uh, drugs and if required starting tocolytic agents. So if all the resuscitative measures are not working, then that would be an indication for cesarean. And vaginal bleeding that occurs after 34 weeks of gestation is also an indication for cesarean. Now what about asymptomatic patients where you have a diagnosed placenta previa at the 16 to 20 weeks uh, ultrasound scan? In those patients you have to repeat an ultrasound at 32 weeks of gestation to see if the placenta has regressed. So if there is at 32 weeks if there is no placenta previa or if there is no low-lying placenta you can just go for routine prenatal care. Suppose there is a placenta previa or there is a low-lying placenta without any placenta accreta spectrum, then you repeat an ultrasound at 36 weeks of gestation. At 36 weeks, if there is no placenta previa, then just continue routine care. If there is persistence of placenta previa at 36 weeks, then go for cesarean that is scheduled at 36 to 37 weeks.
Suppose it is a low lying placenta, that is placenta, placenta whose edge is within 2 centimeters of the internal os. That would depend on its actual distance from the os. If the distance is 1 to 2 centimeters from the os, then you can go for expectant management. But if it is less than 1 centimeters from the os, then you will have to go for cesarean section planned for 36 to 37 weeks. Now, coming to the third arm, suppose the ultrasound at 32 weeks shows a placenta previa or a low-lying placenta, but with a placenta accreta spectrum. In that case, we will go for the cesarean hysterectomy that is scheduled for 34, 34 to 35 weeks of gestation. So, this is the general management of asymptomatic patients with placenta previa. Now, the next topic that we'll talk about is placental abruption. So, placental abruption is a partial or a complete detachment of the placenta that occurs in the third trimester. It is the rupture of maternal blood vessels in the decidua basalis. Common risk factors for placental abruption would be a previous placental abruption, preeclampsia, hypertension, smoking, cocaine abuse, and trauma. Now, before we go on to the clinical features, I would like to mention briefly about the pathogenesis of abruption. So, in abruption, the ruptured vessel could be either an artery or a vein. And depending on whether it's an artery or a vein, the clinical features may differ. In an arterial rupture, there is a high pressure bleeding that is mostly concentrated at the center of the placenta. This, because it's high pressure bleeding, it can lead to a greater area of separation between the placenta and the decidua. And there is a rapid development of symptoms like painful vaginal bleeding, DIC, fetal heart rate abnormalities. So it is a much more uh, a worst case scenario with an arterial rupture. Now, if it is a venous rupture, it is a low volume, low pressure bleed that usually would occur at the periphery of the placenta and there is going to be a smaller separation between the placenta and the decidua. This leads to less severe symptoms like just a slow, low volume bleed. But what happens here is that it's a chronic bleed which can eventually lead to long-term outcomes like growth restriction and oligohydramnios. Now what happens in abruption is that bleeding from the decidua would lead to a release of tissue factor. This tissue factor can activate the coagulation cascade and that can lead to thrombin formation. Thrombin can do two things. One is that thrombin can act as a uterotonic agent which can lead to a uterine hypercontractility. And the second is that the tissue factor can enter into the methylene circulation and eventually lead to DIC, that's disseminated intravascular coagulation, which is a very important um, outcome of abruption of placenta. Okay, so coming to the clinical features of abruption, there is a painful vaginal bleeding in the third trimester. Please note that it is painful, unlike placenta previa, which is painless. It is accompanied by abdominal pain or back pain and there is increased uterine contractions. On palpation, the uterus is going to be rigid, firm and tender. Now, abruption can also be contained without visible bleeding. Now, this happens because of accumulation of blood between the uterine decidua and the placenta with no visible vaginal bleeding. So, because there is a possibility of a contained placental abruption, the volume of external vaginal bleeding does not essentially correlate with the severity of the abruption. Instead, it is the degree of the abdominal pain and the hemodynamic instability or the fetal heart rate anomalies that are better indications of the severity of abruption. And these are what denote clinically significant separation. So other uh, clinical features, as I mentioned, is maternal hemodynamic instability due to blood loss, fetal heart rate abnormalities, and eventually can lead to DIC as well. So coming to the management of abruption, in case of hemodynamically unstable patients, the main thing is for stabilizing them. So rapid resuscitation with IV crystalloids, blood transfusion, if that has not stabilized the patient, go for massive transfusion protocol in a 1 is to 1 is to 1 ratio. Uh, 
keep the mother in left lateral decubitus position because that will reduce the compression on the uh, vena cava and it, IVC and it can and it will increase the uh, venous return to the heart. Then you have to give anti-D immune globulin in an RH negative patient and in case of continuing maternal instability we have to go for cesarean delivery. Now what about a stable patient? If it's a hemodynamically stable patient with a reassuring fetal heart rate status, then we'll go for bed rest and observation. Now the further management would depend on the gestational age. If the gestational age is less than 34 weeks, we will go for what we do for in, in case of a preterm uh, delivery or preterm labor. We'll have to give corticosteroids then that's mainly for fetal lung maturation then you could consider tocolysis and eventually we we'll wait for vaginal delivery if the gestational age is more than 34 weeks if it is 34 to 36 weeks with active contractions so since she's already in active contractions you can just um, go on with vaginal delivery proceed with vaginal delivery Suppose it is 34 to 36 weeks with no active contractions, no fetal distress, there is no active bleeding, then you can essentially go for expectant management. If it is more than 36 weeks, then usually we will go for induction of delivery. Now, our next and final topic is going to be Vasa Previa. Vasa Previa is when fetal blood vessels overlie the cervical os. Now, risk factors for vasa previa is a velamentous cord insertion. Here, the umbilical vessels are not covered by Wharton's jelly. They just have fetal membranes, so they are quite prone to damage. So, that is one. Second is a placenta previa or a low-lying placenta, succentuate placenta, multiple gestations and in vitro fertilization. So, these are a few risk factors for vasa previa. Clinical features of Vasa Previa, this is going to be a painless vaginal bleed along with ruptured membranes. Now, since in Vasa Previa, the origin of blood is essentially from the fetus, the volume of bleed is going to be low volume and it's going to be painless. But since the blood is from the fetus, it can lead to fetal heart rate abnormalities and it can lead to a very uh, rapid fetal demise and exsanguination. Also, uh, there is a risk of compression from the descending fetal uh, presenting part and that can eventually lead to fetal asphyxia as well. So, how do we manage Vasa Previa? So, the first option is for a scheduled caesarean which is scheduled for 34 to 35 weeks of gestation. These are usually in cases where the Vasa Previa was diagnosed previously by an ultrasound at 18 to 20 weeks of gestation. Here you can schedule the caesarean before labor starts. Now, the second is an emergency caesarean. Now, when do we do this? Emergency caesarean is indicated in case of when if the mother is in labor or if there's a pre-labor rupture of membranes. If there is active bleed with fetal tachycardia or a sinusoidal heart rate pattern or in any case of non-reassuring fetal heart rate tracing, we'll go for an emergency caesarean. So essentially what happens is we will go for expectant management if the mother is at less than 34 weeks of gestation and without uh, any of these above features that would indicate an emergency caesarean. And basically, we are trying to get delivery of the fetus to occur before the onset of labor or rupture of membranes. So that is what our goal is. So that is with management of Vasa Previa. And that is with this entire video. Thank you and I hope you enjoyed it.